Um, very, very warm welcome to everybody who's come this afternoon. Uh, we're looking forward to an absolutely fascinating autumn conference event. I'll just take you through a few bits of housekeeping first um, before I invite Carol to introduce Professor Brian, who is our main speaker for the day. Um, so my name is Carolyn Leary, I'm chair uh, of the Sheffield Emmy Fibro Manager Group. I'm one of a group of trustees um, who run the organisation and you will probably also know Harriet, um, who's our communications officer and works in the office here. Um, Chris and Sarah are two benefits workers, uh, neither of them are present here today, but if you've got any benefits queries, come and ask them, we can pass messages on. Um, so, in terms of today's programme, we um, are planning on uh, having a presentation by Professor Brian Hughes, which will run through till about somewhere between 20 past to half past three, um, and then an opportunity to have the buffet and a cup of tea uh, for just about half an hour, maybe, uh, and then we'll come back in for a question and answer session. So, as Professor Hughes is talking, or while you're enjoying your professor roles, please be thinking of some interesting questions. Today's event is going to be uh, on a live feed on our Facebook events page, and we will also afterwards um, cut it down and put it on YouTube as well. So if you've got any other people you know who would have liked to have come, um, please tell them to, to look, and we'll post the YouTube link on our Facebook page. What that does mean is that if you want to appear on television, you can do some really lively and creative heckling. Uh, but bear in mind, we do have the opportunity to edit things before it goes on YouTube. So, uh, right, we uh, the the toilets. Does everybody know where the toilets are? Just out of these double doors to the left and there. Um, left again. Um, there's some ladies there. Um, there is no fire alarm planned. No fire practice planned. Um, so if the fire alarm does go off, uh, please follow myself or Harriet and we will be leading you out through the main fire exits uh, across the road. So without further ado, I think I'd really like to um, invite Carol to introduce Professor Hughes. I'm very grateful to Carol because she's been instrumental in helping the group organise an amazing programme of speakers from many places beyond, um, even beyond England. So uh, uh, we're very grateful and we hope to offer you further speakers next year at both our AGF and our Autumn Conference. If you have suggestions you'd like to make to us of people you'd like to, us to invite, then um, please, please come forward with those suggestions or email us in the office. Um, but I'm very grateful to Carol for organising today's event and I will hand you over. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Marilyn. <laughs> um, it's always wonderful to have highly accomplished people, such as uh, today's speaker, uh, coming to speak to us at the group. The problem that I, I always have is uh, just how much to tell you about their accomplishments, because it could go on for so long. However, um, I've got a condensed version here of, um, of today's guest's accomplishments, which are many. Um, professor Brian Hughes is a Professor of Psychology at the National University of Ireland, Galway, and he's held academic, vis visiting academic positions at King's College London, Leiden University, the University of Birmingham and the University of Missouri. He's a noted authority on the impact of mental stress on human physiology and has served as president of both the International Stress and Research Society and the Psychological Society of Ireland, of which he is now a fellow. He has wide-ranging media experience and is an author of several books, including Psychology in Crisis, where he uses the PACE trial as an archetypal example of bad psychological science. For anyone here, and for reasons that we all understand, might still be wondering why an ME and fibromyalgia group have invited a psychologist to speak, perhaps the following statements from Brian will put your mind at rest. 
Extensive research has shown that ME-CFS involves disruption of several bodily systems, including the nervous, immune, endocrine, cardiovascular, and gastrointestinal systems. We should not see ME-CFS as resulting from mass cognitive hysteria among a quarter of a million UK citizens. Rather, we could see the biopsychosocial theory of ME-CFS as a grand sanctimonious delusion shared by a professional clique who, for circumstantial reasons, find themselves dominant in British behavioural health care. So thank you for saying that, Brian, and I hope you're all reassured by that. We're very grateful to Brian for travelling from Ireland to speak to us today. So please welcome Professor Brian Hughes. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, it's certainly a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to make the journey from Ireland into Brexit Britain while I still can, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, having got through all the borders hard and soft in between. Um, today, as, uh, as has been said, I want to talk uh, from a psychological perspective, or a psychologist perspective, and it's absolutely reasonable and fair uh, that, uh, uh, that psychology is talked about in a critical fashion. Um, I know and I'm fully aware that uh, people have uh, guarded views about the role and impact of psychology on ME and CFS and related conditions, especially in the UK. And my take on it would essentially be uh, relating to those problems as problems. Um, now psychology has a lot of damage in this area, but psychologists, uh, some of us, have a, a take on why that damage has occurred because psychologists are humans too, and as scientists of human behavior, we can look at the psychologists and tell you why they're doing what they're doing and what they're doing wrong. So essentially, this is a presentation about the human error factor and how that has affected uh, the way ME and CFS have been uh, sort of uh, dealt with, especially in the UK context by the psychology professions and by others who are influenced by the psychology professions. Now I'm going to use the term MECFS as I go along, as partly to, uh, I suppose, decide on some term, because there are so many different approaches one could take. Um, and, but it is also sort of the working terminology for now within the NICE guidelines uh, exercise. And those guidelines, of course, are hardly something we want to uh, uh, valorize, but nonetheless, they are the guidelines and I'll just use that term as I go along, um, you know, with the footnote attached that other terms are also available and perhaps in due course we will decide on better terms. Um, but when I was uh, uh, writing the book called Psychology in Crisis, which might give you a sort of a sense of, of how I'm uh, kind of feeling about all of this, I did use the case trial and the NECFS controversy as that example, as has been mentioned earlier, of everything that is wrong with uh, psychology, the way theoretically things go wrong, the way statistically things go wrong, the way measurement is done badly, the way um, uh, conclusions are exaggerated, and all of those sort of human factors in play in the research pipeline itself. So today I will begin by just setting the scene a little bit, uh, talking about uh, human factors in medical and healthcare research more broadly. So the, you know, people think that research is watertight, that because scientists say dot, 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 that you can go on to rely on the rest of that sentence. But we'll have a bit of a look at this because that is far from the case. And just like any process of work where people try to produce something, there is a production pipeline that is subject to human factors. Because research isn't done by machines, and even if it were, those machines would be designed by humans anyway. So human factors would always come into play. Naturally, I will talk about the case in the field of, of MECFS as a particular case of this type of problem. And I will also then say a few words about what I refer to as the real biopsychosocial model. And many of you will have heard the term biopsychosocial being used by uh, practitioners who want to defend what is really a psychiatric model 
of MECFS. <coughs> I would argue that a uh, biopsychosocial model is very different from what these people are talking about. And to use the term biopsychosocial model to talk about a psychiatric model, to say that MECFS is a psychiatric condition, is actually misdirection. It's actually using terminology to deflect criticism, and it's using terminology inaccurately. Um, and then we'll wrap up with some uh, thoughts and conclusions. Okay, so uh, how can we say about human factors in medicine and healthcare research? Well, the good news is I'm not the only person saying this. There's a huge community talking about the state of the research literature. And when we remember that research is done by humans, and humans are fallible, then it is no surprise that research is fallible. It follows logically. And the whole point of the scientific revolution of lifting us from the dark ages and creating information that we can be relied upon, it's all based on sharing and peer reviewing and double checking and replicating and being sure you are sure you are sure. Science grows over a slow period of time. There's no such thing as fast science. Um, but when um, people have looked at the state of the scientific literature, not everything that gets published in a scientific journal is double-checked and triple-checked and quadruple-checked. In fact, as we will go on to see, it is seldom checked at all. It is done once and it appears in a journal. And people who have made a, a job out of looking at this in particular come up with conclusions like this. A very famous paper a few years ago why most published research findings are false. This is the piece of research that looks at uh, fields, particularly healthcare related fields. And that was the conclusion. And we will go on to talk a little bit about why they came to that conclusion. But the conclusion is that actually most published research findings are false. That's not some crank on a website uh, with a blog, like me. Um, this is uh, a published paper in its own right and a very respected one, because it created an understanding that actually the research pipeline is full of holes, and there are many leaking points where, where, where things go wrong, and uh, the end product isn't necessarily as reliable as we think it is. The problem is we don't know typically which half of the research literature is reliable. So when you see a study, it could be in the half that isn't false, or it could be in the half that's true. Big problem. Um, and it's not just psychologists and behavioral scientists. Here, and I will show you occasionally some graphics that show data, and I'll explain to you why you can just uh, squint at this and look at the big color blotches and draw your conclusion. This is a pie chart showing research replicability. Uh, a drug company looked at its data sets and double checked the results of its cancer drugs and found that three quarters of the results were different second time round. So what got published in the journal was not replicable. And this isn't some outside regulatory authority. This is the drug company itself checking its own findings. So cancer research is an area where people have identified lots of problems in the research pipeline, human factors that cause research to go wrong. And to give you a glimpse of why they, uh, of the types of factors we're talking about, these people from the drug company, in publishing this in a major uh, academic and scientific journal, they, they, they discussed it and they pointed out that there is immense pressure uh, on uh, and competition on laboratories and, and pressure to publish. So the, the research is done in a hurry for commercial reasons a lot of the time, or if not for commercial reasons, for reasons of vainglory uh, amongst uh, researchers. Most academics academic psychologists are not working for companies, they're working as public servants. And that makes it sometimes even worse, because the only reward you get there is a claim. So when you're looking for money, you might cut corners, but when you're looking for a claim, you might lie. You know, you might just put yourself um, uh, in a positive light when it should be gone. Uh, so there's a competition among laboratories. It's a real human problem that creates a, a problem with results. And um, a, a bias, excuse me, towards publishing good news. That, that, that you'd think that this wouldn't happen in science and it wouldn't happen in cancer research, and yet this is what these researchers were saying was part of the problem, creating uh, unreliability in cancer research. So it does happen. 
And one of the most important lessons to learn from the research on human factors in research itself is that it is subject to human failings. Nobody is beyond human failings. And we need to have a completely uh, clear understanding of the research picture as a whole. We need to have research replicated. We need to have all sorts of uh, checks and balances because the first draft of research is very likely to be wrong. There's a 50-50 chance or a three-quarters chance if it's a cancer drug trial or whichever way you look at it. It is simply not the case that because scientists say, quote unquote, that uh, what follows can be reliable. Um, here is something that, um, uh, that, that can, can be a problem in and of itself, and that's just reporting accuracy. So medical research will have its own guidelines, how you should report research, because after all, it needs to be checkable. It needs to be inspectable. It needs to be possible for someone from outside to look at the research report and decide whether it was done well or badly. Uh, and so the medical journals have for many years set guidelines for this. Uh, but a very recent study, published in 2019, summarized uh, an inspection of the medical journals and found that only 13% of trials were reported correctly. So they don't even follow their own guidelines most of the time. So you have, upon this idea that some of the results are not reliable, you have this problem of not knowing which ones are which, because there isn't enough information in the research reports to help you understand what the researchers actually did. That's a big problem, and it's a problem that I refer to here as the Dolebaker effect because uh, an advocate, uh, whom you might have heard of before, called Ben Dolebaker, did this piece of research revealing that most journals don't police their own standards adequately. And that is not relevant because Dolebaker himself might have one day something to say about NECFS. Okay, so. And um, five most published research findings are false. Well, without getting into all the particulars, uh, the researcher here, Ioannidis, Don Ioannidis, identified risk factors for dodgy research. And he said research is more likely, because this is all based on statistical modeling and checking different journal articles and checking different data sets. And he found that research is more likely to be unreliable if you're looking at small samples or small effects, by small effects you mean tiny differences between group A and group B, that makes the research more likely to be unreliable. And what can be referred to as scattered on approaches to statistical analysis, sort of, you know, trying everything to see what works. There are various things that we know. I won't go through all of these in fine detail because it's simply to make the point that we can begin to identify the risk factors. We can begin to sort of piece through the rubble to try to find uh, the, the reasons why uh, the whole thing is collapsing. Um, we also know that uh, in psychology research, pure and simple, maybe psychotherapy research, cognitive behavior therapy, we will talk about a little bit um, uh, today. We know that a lot of the research literature there um, is unreliable um, in various ways. And um, one of the problems is that researchers do a study uh, they discover that CBT isn't half as cracked up to be, and then they don't publish the result. So all that's left in the literature are the studies that worked. And uh, even though there, is a, there are conditions applied to grant funding, in the United States, the National Institute of Health funds medical research, but one in four research studies funded by that body looking at treat CBT treatments for depression aren't published. So the findings do not filter into the literature. And if those known findings, if they're known findings, that would help paint a clearer picture of whether CBT is useful for depression in every single case. So there's a wide ranging set of problems here that cause difficulties. And I'm going to show you um, uh, some uh, pictures again, because in psychology, around 2012, so we're getting into seven years ago now. Um, there was a big controversy because these psychologists had teamed up and had selected studies from the psychological literature, many of them used in textbooks and so on, and had attempted to do the study again independently to see if the findings could be replicated. So it was part of this idea of 
can you replicate a finding? And what they pointed out was that, largely speaking, you couldn't. So they got 100 studies from mainstream journals, and this is what they found. And this is a pictorial representation of numbers, so all you have to look at here is shapes. On the left-hand side of this graph, you have original studies, and if you see here at the bottom, there's something going on, there's some color. That shows you good effects, clear effects, okay? That's what that means. And when they did the replications on the right-hand side, this is what they came up with. Findings that were literally all over the place. Most of the findings were nowhere near as good as the findings in the original study. So this is how they painted a picture of their, their replication attempt. And they found that across 100 studies, in most cases, these, the study wasn't reporting a reliable finding. That's in psychology. That's what it's called, what we now refer to as the replication crisis in psychology. Because these weren't strange studies. Many of these studies were in undergraduate textbooks, teaching undergraduates how humans think, feel, and behave. And, and, and these are key studies in the area. And I have to point out, many of them are still in the textbooks, even though the replication attempt uh, is, it, it shows that the finding can't be reproduced. And you would have thought in the science that reproducibility is the, clear, is the key requirement. Incidentally, uh, by way of um, a footnote, some of the researchers who did the original studies complained that their finding was reliable, but the replication was unreliable. Uh, so, you know, you have to do it a third time, perhaps, to, to clarify matters. And that's how science works. Again, as a footnote to a footnote, when you think of science as a school subject, you think of uh, physics and chemistry as school subjects, for example, Pupils in school do the same experiments over and over again. Thousands of times a year, across hundreds of schools, these experiments take place every single year. You, you put, add two chemicals, chemicals together, they change color. You put something into the flame, a blue flame comes out. All of these things are replications of an experiment that was done originally. So in science like physics and chemistry, these replications happen all the time. It's the basic way science works. But in psychology, fewer than 1% of studies are ever replicated. So the study is published and it is assumed to have a finding that could be relied upon without, without any replication to double check. So that's a big problem. All right. So what I refer to as human factors, what are these human factors? What types of things do we talk about? I'm sorry the color there is a bit darker on, on, on the big screen, but we'll talk about these um, uh, in general and I'll give you one or two examples. One of the ones that's very relevant for us today is called therapeutic allegiance. So if you're a therapist and you have a favorite therapy, then you're going to do research of that therapy. Guess what? Most of the time, therapy is effective in your study. Um, but when an independent person does a study on your favorite therapy, the findings are not as good. And that is a problem called therapeutic allegiance, and it's a big problem. We'll look at some examples on that. Um, there's a thing there called white hat bias. And this refers to the cowboy hats uh, that used to be used in old movies, where the good guys wore white hats and the bad guys wore black hats. And white hat bias is the way that researchers interpret data to produce good news. My therapy worked. Even though another person can look at the same data and come to a different conclusion. But the, with the selective way you interpret things to put yourself in a positive light to show how you are the good guy is called white hat bias. And it's a very big problem in public health research when people are looking at interventions to change health behaviors, to improve you know, exercising or smoking or something like that. The researchers end up with overly optimistic conclusions about how good their intervention is because they see themselves as doing good work by even designing the intervention in the first place. Okay. Um, so let me... Um, uh, say a little bit uh, and show you a, a, a graphic again on therapeutic uh, allegiance. Um, therapeutic allegiance is this idea that your favorite therapy works um, because you did the study and it's your therapy. All right? Now, there is a way of doing that and some re of, of checking that. Some researchers have gone back to all the scientific papers in all the journals and looked and categorized uh, papers based on is this researcher. Uh, a, does they have, do they have an allegiance to the therapy in question? So does this is this study of cognitive therapy being conducted by a cognitive therapist? 
is this study of behavior therapy being conducted by a behavior therapist. Okay, and, and using that approach, looking through hundreds of studies, uh, and filtering out the ones that were conducted by people who had their had conflict of interest, and the ones that were not conducted, um, they drew a conclusion, which is um, uh, hard to see here, but they, 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 they drew all of these different findings, they come up with this little diamond at the bottom. What that diamond means is that the findings are biased in one direction. They're not on the line, they're to the right of the line. And what that means is that on average, when a study is conducted by a person who has a therapeutic allegiance, they overestimate how good the therapy is. And that is systematic, you can, that's just mathematics. So just categorize studies in terms of, did the researcher have a therapeutic bias? And if so, how big was the finding? And on that basis, mathematically, the finding gets bigger if the therapist has done the study themselves. So that's called, uh, let's talk about what we can refer to as a non-financial conflict of interest. Uh, the, the, the researchers who do the therapy or the therapists who do the research um, uh, have, have, have uh, a motivation to save face. They want the therapy to work. Okay. Um, here is a, just in terms of uh, uh, replication. Replication is very rare in psychology, as, as I mentioned. Fewer than 1% of studies are ever replicated. So we're relying on the first attempt 99% of the time. But even within that 1%, there's a problem. And the problem looks like this in two bars. Um, when you replicate your own study, you tend to get your own finding back again, second time round. But when independent people replicate your study, it's far less likely that they will get the same finding. Uh, so you're marking your own homework if you do your own study. So, spoiler alert, when we're talking about research in any CFS, like uh, the PACE trial, the only proper check on the PACE trial will be for an entirely independent group to come and do a similar study. So all of the ancillary studies that the same group of people or their colleagues do to say, oh yeah, it definitely works, because we've kept it again, um, they cannot be relied upon because of this type of bias. It's a human factor in the research process. It wouldn't happen in physics. Why should it happen in uh, clinical research? Okay, so let's move on then to the case of MECFS as an example. Some of you will know some of the particulars I'll talk about. Others of you uh, might not have all of them at the tip of your tongue. So let me just go through, uh, for example, uh, to begin with the PACE trial itself. So uh, the PACE trial, is, as you know, is a large-scale study that is held up as the basis for clinically recommending uh, greater exercise therapy and cognitive behavior therapy for the condition known as chronic fatigue syndrome, sometimes known as other things to different people at different times. So the whole study was done, originally set up by a group of researchers, and it's based on the dysfunctional belief theory of CFS. In other words, that those symptoms you have have nothing to do with your body, they're all to do with your mind. And that you may be uh, experiencing physical uh, symptoms, but they are not caused by any central dysregulation of the nervous system, the endocrine system. They're caused by bad thoughts, and um, by you have cognitively <laughs> convinced yourself that uh, either, on the one hand, and it comes in different shapes and sizes, either you're kind of, you think you have symptoms that you don't really have, or you are so afflicted by this dysfunctional beliefs that you damage yourself by, lacking, by lack of exercise. So you deprive, you decondition yourself, as they say, because you are so afraid of exercise, you don't take any exercise, and therefore that's why you're physically um, um, a believer. Okay, that's the dysfunctional belief theory. Most people intuitively can see that that doesn't really fit um, their experience. Of course, a person's personal experience might not be the whole story, but rest assured, there is wide-ranging medical research showing all sorts of physical abnormalities that could not be caused by cognition in people with CFS, ME, and all of these conditions that overlap in certain ways. So there is definitely a bit of physical basis, and in the United States, the National Institute of Health equivalent, the Institute of Medicine, uh, has, 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 has no deviation from that. This is their consensus view. 
This is a, 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 a neurological inflammatory condition. It's not a mental condition. Okay. Um, nonetheless, the PACE trial happened. And I, I would argue that straight away, once the trial happens, you've got a problem because the rumor is out there. And it's hard to get a rumor back again. And once the clinical professionals see that a prestigious university research team have done a study, they put a lot of belief in that fact without even seeing any data or looking at any methodology. Okay, so the study was a five year long study. There were 600 plus patients and they reported positive change for a whole bunch of people who got GET, quid exercise therapy and CBT, positive behavior therapy, compared to medical care, standard medical care. And they even found in this study where some people got these therapies and other people didn't, they said that 22% of the people who got the good therapies as they saw them, GET and CBT, recovered, quote unquote. They didn't just feel better. They didn't just say they were happy. They recovered from their condition, according to the paper in 2013. That's a greater than one in five rate of recovery. Now, for a condition that has caused so much uh, anguish and has been proven so difficult to uh, grapple with clinically, any therapy that provides 22% recovery rate is worth looking at. This is, this is an amazing finding. Okay, we're all amazed. Um, and so the NICE guidelines, you did that study and a few other ancillary studies and studies by overlapping research teams, uh, smaller studies, but the PACE trial remains uh, the biggest study and given that it was led by psychologists and was based on behavior and cognitive intervention, it's, it's, these are psychological interventions, it's probably the largest ever, in terms of funding, uh, intervention trial ever done in psychology in Britain and maybe other places too. Okay. So let's start breaking things down. First thing is therapeutic allegiance. What does the therapeutic allegiance would look like in this study? Now, uh, the study had a, a, a group of what we call principal investigators. It was a large issue, but there's a small number of people who are key and who are persistently uh, the, the, the lead investigators. And um, I won't uh, name names here because people know it's in the public domain. I pixelated the names. But what I would point out is that each of the three main leaders of the study had published, in some cases, years prior, uh, beliefs that this condition is treatable with cognitive behavior therapy and graded exercise therapy type interventions. So they are on record professionally as saying that this therapy works before they did the study. So it's a big ask to do the biggest ever study in psychology and interventions on your own interventions and prove yourself wrong. Uh, the therapeutic allegiance dimension is impossible to ignore because all of these folks, and this is just examples of books they publish, they have done numerous conference presentations and other uh, public statements where they had said, that CBT definitely works for chronic fatigue syndrome or various conditions related to chronic fatigue syndrome. So, I mean, you shouldn't do that in science. You shouldn't say what you think is going to happen and send the world and commercially produce. Now, I know you can't make a, a living off books. Um, the royalties won't go very far. But nonetheless, financially, you are um, deriving benefit from your public statement. You're not going to turn around necessarily or easily and say, actually, Everything I said for the last uh, 10 years, 15 years is wrong. Uh, so there's a huge bias.
person administering the therapy shouldn't know I hope I'm not being patronizing to the researchers, but I recall being taught this as a first year undergraduate. You know, this is elementary stuff in psychology methodologies. Um, it, it is, uh, you don't, if you tell the people what's going to happen, they will cohere to that in a particular way. And remember, for CBT, it's all about teaching you uh, to say good things about your life. So at the start of the study, you're depressed, and the end of the study, you're saying you're happy. Because CBT is partly about teaching you to find happiness in your life. Okay, so so there are multiple biases here, but actually it, it went worse than that. They, they they told the participants in the CBT group that they were in the treatment group, that CBT works, that CBT is evidence based, and that all the other people in the group were finding it fantastic. They posted the newsletters in the mail to their home addresses with that message being presented. So far from being a lack of blinding, it was almost, we might say, a deliberate effect, or deliberate attempt to have reverse blinding uh, built in to the procedure of the study. So it, 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 it's a scandalous form of, 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 uh, of, of uh, a flaw. Um, I refer briefly to an, an organization called the Science Media Center. Uh, these are a PR company. Well, what do they say about blinding and research like this? Well, actually, they're again um, uh, bad studies. They say in February 2019, it's been established for at least 17 years um, that blinding is absolutely essential uh, for clinical trial design. And it's very shocking that in this case, a British medical journal, uh, journal a BMJ journal, uh, should publish a study uh, in which patients were aware of which group they were in. This wasn't the base trial I'm talking about. This is something else. Um, so the Science uh, Media Centre, who you might think the name sounds like you know, a group of people who are just interested in good science, they say that blinding is absolutely essential. And, it, and, and for the British Medical Journal to publish a study in 2019 that, that, that involved telling people which group they were in is, 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 is unacceptable, it's deeply shocking. We'll come back to the Science Media Centre in a little bit in a few moments. Um, so I'll just leave that there for you, okay? That's, a, that's, a, that's a deliberate, and we'll call back on that. The second of the three problems I'll refer to is called moving the goalpost. Everybody knows that metaphor. It involves changing the rules as you go along in order to make it possible for you to win the game. So the easiest way of talking about this, because they did it in lots of ways, the people who designed the pace trial, they had a plan, and they said that they're going to measure recovery in a particular way. And an example of this was uh, you needed to have a score of 85 or higher on the physical function scale, okay? But halfway through the study, they decided, no, let's make that 60, okay? They looked at the data, and they said, let's make that 60. <coughs> they also required that you had to have a score of 3 out of 11 on the fatigue scale. But halfway through this trial, they just, and this is the basis on which they were funded. Okay, but after they got the money and set up the trial and did the study and collected some data, they decided, no, let's make that 18 out of 33. Looks different, but it's actually a much more generous threshold and makes it easier to recover. Um, Self-reported health, there's a questionnaire. If you say you're very much better, that would be part of your recovery score. Uh, but halfway through this trial, they decided, well, let's, let's include the, the much better as well. Not just the very much, but also the much better. And then finally, um, they had different sets of criteria, and they said you had to meet all the criteria to be recovered, but then they decided how to decide, so let's make that just one set of criteria. So they, they moved the goalposts in so many different ways. Remember that in the journal, they reported that 22% of people recovered when they, uh, did, when they crunched the numbers. But when independent researchers got the data set and applied the original study plan, and the original analysis plan 
uh, to the same data, to the PACE trial data, they found that the recovery rate was actually 7%. And that was more or less the same as in the control condition. So these were, it was not significantly different to the control condition. This is the rate of spontaneous recovery in a bunch of people who didn't get any treatment at all. Okay, so that's a huge glaring problem. And I will just say, seeing as this has been recorded, uh, it's well known in the public domain that that data wasn't freely available. The independent researchers and the independent research community had to go to court to get that data from the original PACE trial researchers. Because despite the fact that in order to publish in a medical journal, you have to sign a document saying you will give the data available, you'll make the data available if asked to do so. Despite that, when asked to do so, they declined, they then refused, and then they tried to protect themselves legally from having to share the data. A court proceeding was held, the court said it's publicly funded, you have to release the data into the public domain. They did so, it was analyzed, and this was found, among many other problems. They moved the goalposts halfway through the study and made it look like 22% of people recovered, and in fact, according to their own original plan, only 7% of them, so which was not significantly different from no treatment at all. Okay. Um, here's that in a picture. In a picture, the data are all over here, and they put the recovery threshold down here so that most people were over the line. Okay, let me just uh, let me just leave that with you for a second and point out a, a detail that I don't think many people have focused on, but I, I, I like focusing on. When asked, why did you move the goalposts? It's a logical question, and this tells you a lot about the psychology of human factors in research. Nobody will say, I moved the goalposts because I'm a flawed human being and I didn't know any better. Most people will say, I did this thing you're accusing me of because I have concluded it was the right thing to do. You rationalize after the fact. We're all prone to doing so. So what do they do? They said, no, 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 85 was much better, was much, much too hard. 85, the score of 85 was too high, it needed to be 60. We made a mistake at the beginning. <laughs> Not 85 anyway, and uh, so we need to change the original protocol because otherwise half the general population would fall outside the normal range. But what they were doing there was mixing up their mean and their mean because it's not uh, normally distributed. So the average score was not the halfway point, even though this is how they explained why they moved the goalposts. So actually, this is this is not even university education. This is actually secondary school mathematics. Um, and that is the nature of the error that gets into the paper, that gets into the journal, that gets into the treatment guidelines. Okay, so you're dealing at it, you're dealing with, it's not, in order for the mean and the median to be interchangeable, you need to have normally distributed data. Some of you are familiar with this, but the halfway point is not, uh, is not the mean in this data set. That's just not the way it works. Okay, here's an easier way of putting it. Uh, to be recovered, uh, it was actually possible, incidentally, to have a lower score at the end of the study compared to the beginning and be deemed to have recovered. So the recovery threshold, they moved the goalposts halfway through the study, remember? So the requirement to be in the study in the first place, they couldn't move after the fact. So they, the recovery rate was actually lower than the intake requirement. So for one in um, eight participants affected, uh, they, uh, they, they actually, their scores for, for fatigue went down, oh, sorry, went up. They were more fatigued at the end of the study than before, and yet they were deemed to have recovered because they had moved, they had, uh, they had gone through the new goalposts instead of the old ones. All right, and here's another way of looking at it. Um, uh, they, 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 they
you know, it's not fact, it's not reality. Let me just uh, uh, benchmark this against uh, the, 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 the real biopsychosocial model, as I, as I would call it, um, and then we will uh, wrap up with some conclusions. Um, so ultimately, the concept here, I would say, is that some researchers who have a therapeutic allegiance to a purely psychological worldview, that all illnesses, or at least illnesses of this type, are in the mind, or are perpetuated by bad cognitive patterns, by bad thinking patterns. These folks have basically taken over. They've taken over the show. And they, what they say is in the literature, and they educate some students and go out and educate other students, and there's a ripple effect. And only a tiny proportion of psychology researchers look at this field anyway. But within that clique in the United Kingdom, there's an echo chamber where people just confirm one another's <coughs> presumptions. The actual study, when you get the data set out of the courts and look at biopsychosocial uh, medicine for years. <coughs> These folks are not talking about biopsychosocial that I recognize. They're talking about psychosocial or psychiatric. The bio part is not part of their picture. So what do I mean by biopsychosocial really? I do research on stress and cardiovascular function. Mental stress precipitates elevations in cardiovascular function <coughs> that then precipitate illness. Um, that is uh, a very well-researched uh, set of uh, facts and set of circumstances. We know, for example, that lifelong patterns of physical reactivity exist. So as a, a baby, uh, there are research studies that show that when babies are uh, tested in hospital settings, if they cry or not, uh, can, when it's being recorded, that this helps classify human beings, uh, they, uh, individuals, as reactors or not reactors, and that later life in follow-up, years after the fact, the babies that cry in the labor ward are the ones that have the higher blood pressure responses to mental stimulation um, in, in laboratory tests. We know that people, teenagers, who have high blood pressure responses to stress uh, in laboratory tests um, will continue to be among the highest among their peers 10, 15 years after the fact. It's very high reliability over a lifetime. And so we know a lot about the human fight or flight response, in other words, the human response to stress in terms of cardiovascular function. We know that, uh, and we do all sorts of tests that look at biological realities um, as measured against psychological inputs. So you give people stress tests, just like a cardiologist would for a person being tested on a treadmill. You give them a psychological equivalent of that, uh, a fast-paced cognitive test and you observe the pattern of blood pressure. We know a lot about that. That's biopsychosocial research. Um, the biological part is a central feature. It's not a myth. It's not a, a health belief. It is a fact. It is core to the whole thing. If the biological part isn't there, it's not biopsychosocial. And we know that people who have exaggerated stress responses suffer all sorts of consequences that are real and re re related to real illnesses. And uh, this is one of the reasons, and given that time is against us, I'll just, you know, this is one of the reasons that health agencies all over the world list stress among the risk factors for heart disease. Um, now, it's not to say that stress causes heart disease and that therefore heart disease is a psychological experience. Psycho uh, uh, you know, Heart disease isn't the cause of premature death. You can observe it under a microscope. It is there in the body, and lots of things feed into it. And a true biopsychosocial scientist will look at an illness in that way. But what these folks are doing is they're characterizing an illness as a set of health beliefs. They're telling you that it's in your mind, or that at, at, at the most they can give you is that, okay, you are physically deconditioned, but that's because of your thought patterns making you um, avoid exercise. So they will allow you some physical problem, 
but only as a result of your cognitive defect. That's not biopsychosocial, that's just psychological, I would say psychiatric, I would say pseudoscientific. Oh. So where did this go? How does this affect people in the real world? Um, well, one thing is, you encounter all the time in the NHS uh, people who are under this illusion that any CFS is a cognitive illness and that it is all in the mind. And when we did research looking at practices in um, ME CFS clinics across uh, England uh, in the NHS, uh, we asked them, uh, you know, uh, what, what do you tell patients and how do you deal with harm caused by bad therapy? And to cut a long story short, you don't have to read the paper, um, uh, most clinics don't even allow for the fact. Most clinics say, well, how could the therapy cause harm? It's therapy. Therapy is good for you. And it's in the nice guidelines. They don't even allow for the fact that, as is well documented, graded exercise therapy, for example, causes adverse reaction in a large fraction of patients to whom it's delivered. And they don't even record this. They don't even record treatment harms when they happen. And, and they just allow people to drift away from therapy to fall off the statistics. And they report at the end of the year how many people they treated. They don't check how many people were harmed, how many people did the therapy not work for, they don't track things in that way. So it has real life pragmatic consequences, this um, escalating out of control, pseudoscientific approach to NECFS. Um, it also bleeds out into the general population. So medical science, you know, people are always talking about how they're getting their house in order and fixing the problem. Um, there was a, a review recently uh, withdrawn from the Cochrane system um, because of controversy. And that review was put back. And the NACFS researcher said that vindicates us because it shouldn't have been taken down in the first place. But the technicality is, according to the rules of the system, all that is required to be put back is a complaint by the researcher's concern. So they vindicated themselves. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Okay. Um, uh, the Health Research Authority uh, this year issued a report in response to an MP, um, a letter from an MP, issued an extensive report concluding that actually the PACE trial was fine. And then the, 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 the researchers concerned were all over social media and mainstream media saying we've been vindicated again. But what they didn't point out was that the Health Research Authority simply said it was fine insofar as their remit was concerned. And their remit was essentially to make sure that all the forms were filled out correctly. So their remit is to regulate the funding model, and the funding flow, and the ethics procedures and so on. It's not to actually regulate the science. In fact, the HRA said that the quality of the science was outside their remit. But the people publicizing this in the media, who were driven by the researchers themselves, didn't draw attention to that fact. In fact, they willfully misled the public audience by saying they were vindicated as a result of that report. Uh, just recently, the British Medical Journal published a risk of bias tool, uh, a way, a, a checklist to see how biased a research study is, and it's good for this type of thing. The problem is that the lead author of that risk of bias tool is himself associated with controversial therapy, the lighting process, um, uh, which is sometimes directed at it. So it doesn't ask for blinding, for example. It doesn't identify blinding or therapeutic allegiance as, 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 as risks. It leaves them off. So the risk of bias tool is biased. And yet it is out there, and people are saying we're getting our house in order. It's okay, no problem here. This is fine. Okay. And then we have uh, this final example. Um, I refer back uh, to, um, to, to our friends in the Science Media Center. So we had this news story about the researchers. People are saying things in public about the researchers. And that constitutes.
Pixelation is my friend. One of the people on the Science Media Centre Board of Trustees is a person of interest in the PACE trial, one of the research supervisors of the PACE trial. So that group has a conflict of interest in talking about the PACE trial, but you go onto their website, you'll see they talk about the PACE trial all the time. And it always, just, and notice they're not saying the trial is excellent, they're saying we're being harassed, the researchers are being driven out of science by, uh, you know, by naive patients who don't know any better. Okay. Remember, the Science Media Center, they, they, they think blinding is important, and if you don't have blinding, it's, it's deeply shocking. Uh, but that is, okay, you're talking about a study using acupuncture to treat menopausal symptoms, which is what they were complaining about in February, but they don't use this language to talk about exactly the same situation with the PACE trial. In fact, they use a completely different set of language there, and lo and behold, there's a conflict of interest with the Board of Trustee overlap with the PACE trial team. So, the real world is real, is one of the lessons of this. Uh, we shouldn't be naive in assuming that everything is objective, and scientists say dot 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 is, a, is an introduction to a fact. Um, and you have all this media reporting um, across things like the Times and the Mail, uh, people saying, look at these Oxford researchers being harassed by patients um, who are clearly out of their minds, because after all, they've been diagnosed with a psychiatric condition. See? You see how it works? Um, and so this vilification cycle unfolds. And you end up with people like Rod Liddell, uh, famous for vilifying just about every vulnerable group um, on the list. You can look up his Wikipedia page, you see it's quite lengthy. Um, he decides to put the movie in as well. Um, because he's seen the press release, he's seen the other media reports, he thinks this is a good story um, of plebs, you know, kick back, kicking back against uh, ordinary people, sensible people like himself. So he's talking about, he's uh, maligning these folks, and, and, and there are voices in the media who are defending uh, patient groups and talking about, uh, it's a form of hate speech against patients, uh, which is an arguable case. Uh, so it has real world consequences. Bad science is not simply uh, a, a teaching opportunity um, for students. Um, it is a real life concern. Uh, and the human factors in the research process are real factors that we need to be cognizant of. It's not to say that research is pointless or research is futile. Research is hugely important. And scientific research is hugely important. The, the answer to bad science is not less science. It's more science. It's better science. And that's what we need here. So in conclusion, we need to be mindful of the fact that non-reliability in research is endemic in clinical research. It's as old as research itself. The very fact we have guidelines for randomized control trials and drug trials and all sorts of things like that dates back to the 40s and 50s and 60s in the United States where various committees of government revealed that drugs were available with no evidence at all, and that there was all sorts of flaws in the reported documented evidence at the time. You need to have guidelines because humans cannot be relied upon to do research that is perfect. We are fallible, and we need to be aware of that, and, and we need not to, to, to avoid that fact, and it applies just as much to this area as to any other. Independent replication is critical. You cannot mark your own homework in this area. So the last person to come out and defend a research study should be the researchers themselves. And scientists need to grow up and be more mature about criticism. And the PACE trial, people cannot just rely on their mates to go out and defend them, or to defend themselves, which happens all the time. And that is just not reliable in and of itself. These people are psychologists, for goodness sake. They should know this um, since first year undergraduate. All researchers are susceptible, and all critics are susceptible. I am susceptible. My reasoning is selective. I'm picking the examples. You can challenge my examples and say, well, what about this counterexample? And that's fine. We should all accept that in ourselves. Nonetheless, so should the researchers. And a lack of appreciation for your own bias is, if anything, and this is a quip, a sign of your own bias. You know, if you think you're the only person in the room who isn't biased, well then, then you're not going to make a useful contribution. Okay. Um, human factors underline many of the cock-ups and controversies um, that we see in the area of any CFS research, 
and all the controversies stemming from bad treatment guidelines to public vilification by tabloid journalists of the MECFS community. And the, the human factors are not just the things I'm talking about here about not blinding your study. That's one example of one category of human factor. We're also talking about the way academia works, the way people vouch for one another, the way they review their own work, the way they shape their own thinking, the echo chambers and various other things that occur. We need to get a handle on that. And I would say, I mean, being reviewed. Um, you know, I would argue that these guys, that these processes for reviewing guidelines are not equipped to deal with this type of controversy. They take it a lot on face value. And I've seen, and I've direct involvement with people who have contributed to this, there is a pushback there from the word go. So the nice guidelines review process, there are lots of sincere people trying to do the good job, but there's also a starting position of the current guidelines are fine. These people are important. The research is the biggest study ever done. What's the problem? Why are you saying there's a problem? Um, do, do we need to be, you know, mind your tone? That's the <coughs> feedback you get. Okay. Um, but in a world of profits and controversy, we wouldn't accept it for, if a, for a product on a shelf in a, in, 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 in a supermarket. If there's a fall to the production line that poses a risk to the consumer, we would expect that to be regulated. And this is exactly the same situation. And consumer awareness is key. It can't all be down to regulatory awareness. We need to be mindful of the, 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 the nature of the cockups and controversy. We need to be open-minded about our own assumptions at all times. But we also need to be assertive and informed consumers. And hopefully, some of what I've said to you today will help, help you advocate uh, for your, for, for your uh, position uh, in, in months and years to come. Thank you very much for listening. Huge thank you to Professor Brian Hughes for a very passionately delivered um, and very, very interesting and challenging presentation. Um, I think it's, it's just fascinating that, you know, if you had a car that had, was at risk of had something going wrong, that might cause some damage, that would be recalled. If we were eating food that had risks attached to it, that food would be recalled, and yet we are still being offered treatments which have risks attached to them that are not fully really explained to patients, and that is not being recalled, and we, we, we want that to be the case. So thank you very much for providing us a very powerful argument <coughs> in favor of that. Um, the invitation, oh, just quick check. Uh, Duraya, who's one of our associate trustees, is taking photographs of this event. If anybody wishes not to be seen on a photograph, which could well appear in the group's magazine or in a similar place or the website, um, please could you make yourself known to Duraya to say who you are? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we'll make sure that um, your face is, you know, pixelated. Or, no, uh, we won't use the photograph. Um, so, can we invite people to help themselves to the buffet, this savoury food, this, this uh, sweet food? and have a hot drink, and we'll try and come back in here for four o'clock with any questions that you've got, um, and that includes those people who are, um, those people who are watching this presentation online. Please